this term here, which uh, gave the second derivative of the non scale variance. And this term here corresponds to, it's a false oscillation, so this term here corresponds to the dark matter perturbation. So it's really oscillation driven by dark matter perturbation. And the effective mass is related to the variance of a, uh, a photon density. Okay, so it's really, it's a, and it's really that simple an equation, and then you do that a more careful treatment um, in, um, in GR, but it's really, the, the, it's really an acoustic phenomenon. Um, so one solution, it means that the CMB, sorry, it means that the, it means that the, bar, the photon density, one solution for the photon density would be like a coarse uh, KCST, where C is like sound speed at the time of um, um, the, the sound speed in this fluid at the time of recombination. And so the temperature is proportional to power one quarter of, um, of the uh, photon density. And so by ma mapping temperature, you map the photon density, and then you can learn about the, the quantum and the sets, the exactly parameters. And so um, you have a set of initial fluctu uh, fluctu acoustic fluctuations. And what happens at time of recombination, when the universe becomes um, neutral, you um, the CFD decouple simply uh, radiation and matter are suddenly decoupled, and so we have it gives us directly a snapshot of the fluctuation at the time of recombination, which is what you see here. And, and then there's this fluctuation become projected on the sky, and you you see here the energy. And the first peak I showed you, the large peak, corresponds to the first um, compression peaks. You have this uh, term which which happen when this KCST time of recombination is equal to pi. That's the first compression term, and then you have first rarefaction, rarefaction, and then compression again. So it's really an acoustic phenomenon, and you are measuring uh, the acoustic scale um, phenomenon. And the scale is really set by the sun horizon at the time of recombination. And the, the wonderful thing about the CMB is that really the power of the CMB comes from the fact that we know this, what sets uh, the sound speed of this perturbation is actually at basic atomic physics that we can measure in the lab. So we know exactly what this value should be. And so we can, and we know the physics of a recombination because it's simple hydrogen physics. And so we can predict this value and then we measure, uh, we can measure these peaks and then the comparison of the two allows us to learn more about, uh, about the cosmology. On the state of the art, I mentioned Planck. Again, what you see here is the, cosmic, uh, the power spectra again, the variance as a functional scale, large scale and small scale. And to show you how well we measure this acoustic oscillation, you see Planck in red here, W map, previous generation green, and that consistent now. And then you see higher angular ground based measurement going to very, very small scale, like the Arctic uh, telescope and the South Pole telescope. And you see that we measure tens of oscillations. So we and one model physical. So it's a very well understood uh, phenomenon, very well measured now. And so and the way in order to learn about the signal, what we, the way it works, that you, you have a set of initial conditions which are understood to be set by inflations, which set, let's say, a Gaussian field with some of power spectra, amplitude, and a spectral index, let's say, just a power spectra with a slope. Um, and then you know, you have an effective description of this phenomena, and you know by writing general relativity perturbation theory to first order, so it's linear order, you know to evolve this initial condition in time, you produce a CMB, and then you produce also other observations like CMB, but also galaxy and lower edge. And the power of the CMB, again, is the fact that we can do it all this analytically. Okay, it's linear order, and again, it's something which you can, you can go online, download the code, and it will run on your laptop to a fraction of a second, and this is state of the art, it's very, very accurate. So you can really, all these things is very mature and very, very well understood. Uh, and so, and this really is the power of the CMB from the fact that we have clearly defined initial condition, clearly defined uh, perturbation theory, and then a well measured, uh, well measured uh, observable. Now, um, I'll skip this slide. So, I mentioned the CMB, but the CMB, as we know, is not the only cosmological probe. Right? We also learn, can learn about cosmology <coughs> from. Um, galaxy large scale structure, and if you look at galaxy across the sky, you make a map, and you project it here the slice, and you see the redshift here, and you can see, um, yeah, you see the redshift here, each point corresponds to a galaxy, okay? And you see that 
you see that this distribution is not random. That's you have uh, large scale structures, you have um, you have large scale structure, and you have concentration, which will correspond to galaxy clusters. But you also see filaments connecting these galaxy clusters, and that really what we call large scale structure of the universe that you map using galaxy. Okay. And the important thing that uh, by the same formalism that you use to predict the CMB, you can also predict the large scale structure distribution, and you can look at from this galaxy map in 3D, but it's a 3D because you have one uh, angular position and then a redshift, which is like a distance. You can measure a 3D power spectra. So again, it's a power spectra as before, but this time it's in 3D, so it's a, it's a spatial uh, power spectra. And you see the large scale, small scale, with the wavelengths uh, in uh, h per megaparsec, and you see the power. And interestingly, if you look at this power, you see also little bumps here, which, which are really the analogous, which are the same oscillation that you saw in a CMB, but at a later time. And these are called Marini acoustic oscillation. And it's really exactly the same phenomena of the imprint, what is the acoustic, um, it's a descendant of the acoustic phenomena that you see in the CMB so clearly. And so by measuring, and the interesting fact of course is that these measurements are performed at low redshift. So it's at redshift of 0.5 or 1, where the CMB is at redshift of 1,000. So by, you can, by measuring, by comparing these scales that you measure directly, you can learn about the evolution of the universe between redshift 1,000 or redshift at 0.5. Okay. And, and remarkably, they are, both are extremely consistent, right, which is also a big success of modern physics. What you see here is the power spectra that are found corresponds to the BOSS measurement, which is a large, um, it's a large um, collaboration aiming at building a 3D spectroscopic survey. This points correspond to this measurement, and the, the blue line here corresponds to the prediction using Planck constraint. So you, you look at the CMB at setting up the initial conditions, you evolve in time, you predict what galaxy survey should see, and this is the blue curve. And, it, and it's this blue curve up to an amplitude, which is whose, impo whose um, value is not important, it just has to do with exactly uh, the way galaxies form, right? So that the, the shape, and the fact that you also see these little uh, oscillations again here, uh, again here and here, is really, is, this is set by cosmology, and it's really the uh, power of this. Uh, and so the, the, the big picture here is that we have, we, we have very accurate observation and we can reproduce them with our model at the redshift of 1000 or at the redshift of 0.5. And yeah, that's a new state of the art of, of cosmology. And by combining them, you can learn a great deal about cosmological parameters. So what you see here, you see constraints in two dimensions. So what, when you do cosmology, you try to constrain simultaneously six or seven parameters. And what I show you here is slices in this six or seven parameter space. So you, you try to look for the parameters that are best that are best uh, reproduce your data. And what you see here is dark barium density, dark matter, uh, the spectral index of the initial condition, Hubble constant and amplitude. And the blue corresponds to Planck alone, and the, the red corresponds to Planck alone, and the blue corresponds to the combination of Planck and the air. Okay? And you see that every time this combination, because you have this different redshift, this redshift leverage, the combination is actually very powerful and you can learn, um, you can improve dramatically your constraint in terms of uh, cosmic um, yeah. So now I, will, I would like to tell you a little more about inflation. So why, what are the, um, what can we learn about the physics of the initial conditions? What sets the initial conditions that we observe in the CMB and then propagate uh, and evolve later to form this uh, uh, galaxy survey. And so inflation was introduced in the early 80s by this group of uh, authors here to solve a, an important problem in a, in a class, what's called the classical Big Bang model. Right? And the fact, this model was the fact that the, the relief model, the fact that you, have, you expect some uh, um, natural model will predict uh, um, some topological defects which are not observed and so this was, uh, it was a problem. You have the fact that the universe is observed to be very close to flat, but in practice, to have a flat model in this classic Big Bang theory requires extreme fine tuning of your initial condition. So you have to have very choose very carefully your initial condition, which is not something which is satisfying um, as a for physicist. And then the fact, the important problem was the fact that you have horizon problems. So I mentioned before that if you look at the CMB, 
you look at different parts of the sky, you see exactly the same temperature of the minus mm -hmm. sky, which is, again, very unusual for any kind of astronomical uh, observations. But the more remarkably, if you try to, in, in the context of the Big Bang model, you try to explain why uh, hope this point were not in causal, in causal contact. It means that they've, they've just become causally connected just now, right? So how come they, they had exactly the same temperature all the way to 10 to minus, I mean, up to 10 to minus five fluctuation? So that's what is called the horizon problem. And um, inflation was introduced to solve all these problems at once, and the simple, the key feature of inflation theory is to assume that during a very uh, brief period of time, the universe expands much, much faster than one assumed in the standard Big Bang model, the universe would expand um, exponentially. Okay, that's a generic feature, and you can it solve all these problems because, for example, for the horizon problem, it means that points that were initially, um, that would be initially uh, disconnected in the classical Big Bang uh, model become suddenly, uh, become, now they become connected before this state of initial uh, expansion, and uh, this expansion happen, and then the point would appear as a disconnected, but actually they were connected before, and that's why they, would, they have the same temperature. Um, and again, the flatness problem is also solved, because if you start from a very any initial condition, if you stretch it enough, it will look flat to you, right? So that's really the mechanism behind the, the energy. That allows to solve this flatness problem. So it become, you become very independent of the initial condition, it becomes a universal properties. Um, and the way it is done, typically, is by, by Assuming that during a sh during very early times, the expansion of the universe was driven not by the regular matter that we see around us today, but a new form of matter that we describe as a field, uh, and a, a, a scalar field usually, and which is a well-chosen potential. And the field which is driving this expansion will have the right properties so that we, it will lead naturally to this, uh, this expansion. And, and many, many models were chosen to do that, and now we can, it's something we can do. Well. And so in terms of properties, again, this is a prediction that were done in the 80s, and then none of the observations really supported this plan, but with time, the observation all came to support the inflation paradigm. And for example, the flatness, inflation predicts naturally the universe is flat. It was not done in the 80s, but then uh, various experiments, CMB, that all the old uh, CMB experiment measures the first peak, the first acoustic peak I showed you, which allows to, to measure the flatness very well. So this was, this happened in the early 90s, let's say. Then the, after Kobe, we knew that the primordial perturbations were nearly scale invariant. So this parameter ns is close to one, which was very important. Also, because um, the perturbation come from a quantum fluctuation, we expect them to be mostly Gaussian, um, which is something which was measured very well by, uh, by, uh, by W. Mark and then Planck. And the fact that we have um, photon and baryons uh, trace each other, so that's what is called adiabatic perturbation, it was also well supported by Planck and WMAP, etc. So all this, the key point here is that very specific <coughs> predictions, which are generic to any model of inflation, which were uh, made very early on, and they become supported by observation from the 90s up to now. Okay. And that's why inflation is such a popular theory. And so if we want to, go to if we want to make quantitative measurement about inflation, we, we can look at the initial perturbation for the power spectrum. So the power spectrum of the initial perturbation that will evolve to, the, to, that will evolve to produce the CMB on the galaxy. And you can write it, it's a curvature perturbation, you can write it as an amplitude, and you can have a power law, in this case, a 3D power spectrum, you have the spectral index, NS, I mentioned many times, and then you have what is called a running of this uh, evolution, NS, okay. So it's NS, you expect NS to be close to one, you write it this way, and then you have this running. And you also predict, um, in GR, you can have all kind of, you can have scalar perturbation, you can have vector perturbation, and you can also have tensor perturbation, which correspond to gravity wave type perturbation in your metric. And inflation predicts um, um, tensor perturbations, but the amplitude exactly of this tensor perturbation is not known. And the tensor perturbation, and as you have, I'm sure you have heard of it recently, uh, one of the key signatures is the fact that it leads to very specific polarization pattern on the CMB, which is called the B mode. Okay, and so that's really all the CMB. There are many CMB experiments now trying to measure the B mode. And the motivation for 
measuring this beam model, it really the fact that only inflations, as far as we understand, only inflation will produce generically tensor perturbations. And if we could measure this B mode and we quantify its amplitude by this parameter R, which is tensor perturbation to scalar perturbation ratio at an arbitrary scale. And if we measure this parameter R, we can relate it directly to the energy scale of inflation. So if we could measure R, we know the energy scale of inflation, which means we know when inflation happens. And that's why there's such a large, such a very um, big push in the community to try to measure the B mode of the CMB that could be just too hard. That's a one, one probe of inflation. And finally, another probe of inflation, which I will tell you a little more about, is actually not to only to look at the, uh, to look at initial, to characterize further the initial conditions. Right? So inflation generally predicts Gaussian perturbations, but you also expect small deviation from um, Gaussian density. It means that you, you, have a, you will have a skewness in your, in your initial condition or you have a kurtosis in your initial distribution. And so in terms of uh, cosmology, we call that the skewness to become a uh, bispectra, uh, which is a three-point function in Fourier space, or a trispectra if you talk about kurtosis. And so, and so to, to characterize the, statist the statistics of the initial condition using the power spectra and then the skewness on the trispectrum, is also a very powerful way to learn about inflation. And what you, whereas R motivates, R gives you um, energy scale of inflations, this initial, the statistic of the initial condition tells you the complexity of inflations. It tells you, for example, whether there is one field that drives inflation or multi-field or multiple uh, species that drive inflation, and it tells about their, their relation, the interrelation. So you can, loosely speaking, you can quantify it as it tells you about the complexity of inflation we want to learn and if we really want to build a physics of course the goal of all this is not only to prove inflation but to build a high energy uh, theory of inflation and if we want to do that we will, the only avenue is to, to measure the non-gaussianity and to characterize uh, the initial condition more accurately um, and so if you want to see a little more equations so just just for a flash up but so I showed you before you have a if, if inflation is driven by a scalar field one scalar field with a well-chosen potential uh, to, to lead to inflation, it's called D phi, that's a potential, you can relate all, and if you look at the, if you look at the derivative of this potential, so you have an epsilon, a v, which is uh, defined by D prime over V, you have E tau, which is called the curvature of the potential, V uh, double prime over V, and then you have this uh, psi, uh, epsilon again, not psi, sorry, um, potential, which is this, this quantity here, so, so involving the third derivatives. So by right, so with this, these three quantities, which is again combined first, second, and third derivative of V, you can predict all the observables I just mentioned you. Right? So you can predict NS, the current index. You can predict R. You can predict the running. Um, and, and in, interestingly, for a given potential, the, this uh, quantity of observables would be interrelated. So it means by having one. By um, measuring all of this simultaneously, you can actually constrain specific potential, of, uh, specific model of inflation, specific potential. And so, testing inflation for modern cosmology is testing inflation really, really end up being testing the consistency between these various observables. And here is the state of the art with Planck. Right? So, what you see here, you see the tensor to scalar ratio r as a function of the from angle tilt, uh, from angle tilt, from angle spectral index, ms. Okay. And this envelope here corresponds to Planck alone. And, um, and the blue, no, sorry, the gray corresponds to Planck alone, and the blue corresponds to Planck plus galaxy survey plus PAO. And you see that you have a very specific, very tight constraint in this plane, in a way which are really, really not obvious. And all these curves here, all these uh, various colors, the various curves, correspond to different potentials, the one I showed you before. Right? So for example, here you have a potential that goes like D proportional by phi, this, which is this curve, uh, this curve here, uh, D proportional to phi squared goes like here, D proportional to phi to the two thirds goes is here, etc. So you see, um, you see that for any specific model, you can really make a prediction in this plane, and by using the data, you can, predict, you can constrain this model, and you can actually exclude already um, solution to the inflation. For example, this model here, which corresponds to the um, to phi to the cube, V 
they did this favor by the data. Okay. Uh, and interestingly, also enough, you see, I uh, talked about scale invariance before, and scale invariance in this plot correspond to NS equal one. Okay. But inflation generally, generally predict that uh, we don't have scale invariant perturbation. And the, the, it has to do with the fact that even though inflation is very fast, it's not instantaneous. <coughs> so it means um, different modes will treat the effect of inflation at slightly different times, so which leads to a slight um, scale uh, deviation from scale invariance. And you see that using plan data alone, you can exclude scale invariance to about six sigma. And that's a very profound, uh, that's actually a very profound result. That's really one of the key prediction of inflation which have not been confirmed. And this was already uh, very uh, clearly measured by, by WMAP. But with Planck and with, with Planck CMB alone, you can do that at about six sigma. And again, you see that this, this various inflation model do predict and has to be about 0.96, and this was produced in the early 80s, right? So that's why it's a strong prediction, and that's why um, the community is really, um, there's a strong support for inflation. So that's one of, one, one of the reasons. Um, and you also see that R is consistent with V0. Uh, there's no, uh, no detection for R. And of course, when you, when you, that's why there was also such a large excitement last year when the BICEP2 collaboration announced the detection of R to be very high at R4.2, which would have been about here. So you see that it didn't fit perfectly in this picture. There was a slight, small tension with Planck, but that was a very exciting result, and it was considered that the excitement was, uh, of course, it could be considered as ultimate proof of inflation. And we know that, so there were some problems in the interpretation related to the programs, but at least um, the impact of this result showed us how important uh, this kind of B-mode measurement are for the community. Um, now I want to tell you a little more. Oops, sorry, I want to tell you a little more about the um, how do we how do we constrain non gaussian infinity? How do we measure the skewness? How do we measure the curves of this spectra? And sorry, my slide is a little mangled over here. And so, for power spectra, what we do for the power spectra is a variance. So it's a two pair statistics. We we count what we do is that we at for a given scale we count the number of pairs and we, we measure the correlation functions. We Fourier transform it on a sphere an angular power spectra. For the skewness, it's a three-point function, so we will design a triangle, and we, for a given scale, we'll measure a triangle, we'll Fourier transform it, it becomes, um, it becomes a bispectra. And the bispectra, so the power spectra, as you saw before here, lives in a, is quantified by the multiple. For a bispectra, you have the length of the three light matters, so what you see here is really a three-dimensional plot, but for it's a little bit confusing, you have one leg, one leg, and one leg here. And the, but the important fact is that something we can predict very well too. And you see that the acoustic phenomena that we see so clearly in the power spectra also lead to um, oscillation in the bias spectra along this direction. And okay. um, interesting, the motivation here is that various types of inflation series will lead to various types of bias spectra. And what you see here, and there are different types of, so it's, it's a zoology, there are a lot of models, and so a lot of different bias spectra, but you can still uh, defines three different families of um, um, non gaussian infinity. And for example, the first one is called the local type, uh, and it's, will have, will have model, it will be modeled with multi and by measuring this local type, you will have modeled with multi field or modeled curve term or epigrotic, etc. By adding a uh, non gaussian of the equilateral type, which is the one that will lead to a bispectra with three legs of the same, uh, the same length, you can have all the type of models, and I won't detail you the model, but and then you have another type which is orthogonal. And so the key point, the bottom line here, by look, measuring the bias spectra, comparing with data, you can learn and you can constrain all the other type of models in a way which is different from what you can do with the power spectra. And the plan constraint are the following. You see that with FNL local, which is the, uh, the amplitude of this local type perturbation, or this equilateral here, or orthogonal here, you see that we measure this extremely well. So it's a factor of six increments of a double map. Um, um, but you see that all of these numbers are consistent with zero. So it means we have not detected, we have no hint of problem on non Which is a really, uh, I mean, it's, we shouldn't take it for granted that the scale we observe, the CMB we observe is Gaussian. There is really not, uh, it's not very, sim it's, not, it's not natural at all to have a Gaussian uh, field throughout the scale, which is so perfectly Gaussian. So it's again something very profound. 
and for in, in the context of inflation, it relates directly to the fact that um, uh, perturbations were uh, some kind of quantum origin. So it's a prop, it's a non, very non-trivial statement. Um, and in fact, you could also say that because of this, um, we measure we, using these constraints. We measure. The, we know that the CMB is Gaussian to one part in a million. Right? That's really a very strong constraint. And it's, you, can, you could think, look at it as a, one of the most stringent tests also of inflation. So now, where do we? Why do we still want to? So far, there is no hint uh, for inflation, but we. Um, we still want to measure it, just like we want. There is no hint for tensor B mode, but we still want to measure it because there are <coughs> implications. And for non Gaussianity, it's the same thing. And the, why? The reason is that there are very clear theoretical targets for inflation. So if we focus on this local FNL I mentioned before, if we could show observationally prove that FNL local is smaller than one, then we could uh, we can uh, we can no, we, we we will be able to affirm that. This um, inflation was driven by one field, one only one field. So it would be a pretty simple model. If we show that FNL local is greater than one, then we would show that inflation is uh, driven by multiple fields. So it's a much more complex. Uh, then, if we look at equilateral orthogonal, you can you can learn something about the fact about the exact shape of the potential, whether it's this is what is called slow roll or not. But that's but the important fact here is the fact that there's a well-defined theory target. We want to measure FNL. At the, about the one accuracy. And Klein tells us, as I just showed you, Klein tells us that kind of local to be lower than phi of one sigma. And it, so, most naturally, if we want to learn more about it, we would like to do a better CMB experiment. Right? Klein has been so successful that we want to do more, we would like to do more CMB. But in fact, because we have only one sky, and because the CMB is a band limited signal, if you remember the power spectra I showed you before, you see that the power is really falling on a small scale, and we know why it's falling. So it's a very really band limited signal. It means that there is really a finite number of nodes you can merge on the sky, and so this means that the sampling variance is actually pretty, uh, pretty high. And so it would be very hard to improve on the plaque. And a perfect CMB experiment with a polarization, um, no noise, would be able to construct FNL to about three, right? which is not good enough for for this uh, to reach this one target. However, if we look, the um, Northanity also have a signature in large scale structures, in galaxy survey, just like the Yale also have a signature in large scale structure survey. Non Northanity would also have a signature in large scale structure survey. And with large scale structure survey, we hope to, we, we, we know we can do, we can reach this limit. Okay. And I'll show you just very briefly the way it works to conclude. So the way it works is that pretty much um, to be the galaxy, uh, what is called a bias tracer of dark matter. It means that the, the, um, the galaxy distribution is proportional to dark matter up to a constant, which is called a bias. And what you see here, um, you see a, in, a, in simulation, you see the uh, clustering of galaxies, okay? And it's for various FNL parameters. And the curves correspond to analytical model, and the points correspond to analytical simulations. And um, you see that by for various FNL, you can have, you will have different shape for the clustering of galaxies on large scale, and so but if you can measure the clustering of galaxies on very large scale, you can actually constrain FNL very well. And so it has been done already using a Sloan uh, quasars or Sloan um, um, LHEs, and the current constraints are are the following at about two sigma. So you see, this is not competitive with the CMB, but it's something. That is feasible, um, and this is all, even though this is not competitive, this is already as good as WMAP was. Right? So it means we can use large scale structure constraint as well as WMAP did. Okay, so it's very promising, and so uh, I won't have time to explain you, but we are I'm really um, very excited right now by an experiment which, are, which is called a Spherex, and I would I'm happy to talk offline if you want to, to learn more about it. Whose goal is really to measure the large scale uh, power spectrum of galaxy constrain the FNL. One of the goals is to constrain FNL. And this is, in this plot here, what you see is the running of the spectral index I showed you before, which is important for inflation. And here you see the FNL parameters. Um, these contours here correspond to Planck contours. It means that Planck allows any value in this region. Okay. Um, 